we'll, we'll turn now to the first of our contributed project briefings for today. Um, we're going to hear from um, Joan Kolank of the Wiseman Institute of Science, who is going to be talking about um, research information management system in analytics and how they can actually help researchers as opposed to just being something inflicted on researchers as sometimes these systems can be. So I welcome um, I welcome Joan to CNI and over to you. Uh, hi, uh, can you see my screen, my presentation? Yes, we can see it. Okay, good start. And I'm unmuted, I'll even better. Uh, hi, I'm Joan Kolarik. I'm Chief Librarian at the Weizmann Institute of Science. And my talk is about a process we've developed here to monitor open access obligations of our researchers. Um, and it, while I will mention our, our systems, Esploro, Analytics, and so on, it's not meant to be uh, an in-depth how-to in any way uh, to these systems or any specific program, but to be a brief description of how we've used our tools to answer a growing need. Uh, and I hope you won't get whiplash because it feels like we're moving from a really big picture at JISC to a really narrow focus here. <laughs> um, so there we go. Hopefully I just changed my slide. Um, first, who are we? Weizmann is a basic research institute with various science faculties, and we're located in Israel. But grant-wise, our heart is in Europe. Uh, grants from the European community are a large part of our funding and important to management and researchers. We are small. We have no undergraduates. We only start at the master's level and up. And our library is small too, but we serve a, a di diverse and demanding community where everyone expects a really high level of personalized service. Now, I joined uh, Weizmann Library in 2016, so I've been learning a lot in the last five or so years. Our library uh, is, one might say, aggressively virtual and high tech. The Weizmann Library really early on in like 10, 15 years ago, decided that they wanted to have a virtual library and have pushed it uh, in a big way. And while it's 92% of all of our books and journals, we're at 98% with our uh, journals and articles and such. Um, so this has served us well since 2000, uh, 2020, and we've been able to maintain and expand our library services with little interruption. Uh, getting to the point of this discussion. Weizmann started in the research repository business in 2003, and we passed through some homegrown and ill-fitting systems until 2018 when we moved into Pure. Now that was a huge step forward and it allowed us to start developing additional services for our researchers. Before that, we were basically just writing down, you know, recording articles as they came out. At the request of researchers, almost immediately after that move, we also created our first institutional repository, one could say that with quotes, using Alma Digital and Primo, which we had implemented in 2017, and it started out housing theses, data sets, and um, our open access versions. But unfortunately, we soon found that this combination did not suit our needs. And in 2021, we moved into Esploro, or as we call it, WizWorks, which now houses our combined CRIS and institutional repository. Hopefully you are all familiar with the CRIS, RIMS. They're, they're basically the same thing. Um, so, I recently read, you know, a few months ago, I read the OCLC report on research information management in the United States, and I found it really helpful because of its clear definition of the various use cases for RIMS or CRIS systems in the university. And I included a link at the bottom of this page. And we, we were proud to learn that we were already serving all those use cases in one form or another. So I don't know how that happens. 
Uh, and today I'll only be talking about the compliance monitoring use case, but it does relate to the open access workflow as well. So of, of course, compliance monitoring in the US deals with, a different, with different funders than in Israel. Uh, as I mentioned, for now, our library is very ERC oriented. And so we are concentrating on the ERC funding requirements. And if the, but if the OCLC report is right, it's likely that US compliance requirements will continue to grow. And if so, perhaps our experience will become more relevant and helpful. And just to quote the report for a moment, this use compliance monitoring is about making sense of the complex regulatory environment and the people, grants, and publications within it. It's also about tracking subcomponents of the university community only some publications resulting from specific grants by specific by principal investigators are necessary to monitor and in relation to specific funder requirements. And while local OA policies at US institutions seldom include any consequence for noncompliance, failure to comply with a funder's mandate could result in a loss of funding. And that's where we are. So we're trying to help with that problem. And sorry to bore you with the long quote, but it really did describe the whole thing better than I could. Uh, so even if your experience is different, this presentation is just one example, again, of how an existing system or system tools can be leveraged to solve new and developing problems in a library. Uh, so as I was saying, we, we started learning about open access needs in 2018 when we first moved into Pure and Alma Digital. And at the same time, we also started to hear about grants and their compliance needs, and we knew nothing. So this led to a lot of struggling, and we finally figured out that we needed to meet with our grants office. And we had an initial meeting with them two years ago. And since then, that's developed into an amazing partnership because every time we meet with them, we learn from them and they learn from us, and we all, we both, both sides come out better. And the grant folks explained about reporting requirements and frequency and helped us think about the support which could most help our researchers. And so the first, uh, in response to this first problem that we learned about, our first solution was that we started collecting grants and related researchers and then adding connections in related assets. And because we had already started adding open access information as soon as we moved into Pure, this uh, coincided nicely and, prof and provided the basis for the service that we provide today. So then once our researchers learned that we had grant information, we started getting requests to help with compliance reports about a year and a half ago. And first we got the occasional request and then we started we got to the point where we were getting at least a handful a month. And then we realized that there was another problem, which is procrastination. All our researchers would come in the last week before their grant was due and ask us to do help them. And for one report, one week night notice can work. But when several researchers all get together and give us one week to complete their publication review, generate and find all the open access, the required open access versions, and then respond to them in an orderly manner in time for their ERC deadline, we had a problem. So we went back to the grants office for another meeting, and we learned from them that they actually emailed the researchers two months in advance. <laughs> they didn't have to come to us one week beforehand. Um, and all they had to do was start, start CCing the library on these emails and boom, we knew what we had to, we knew that we had the information we needed to provide a proactive service. And so now we're able to start reviewing the related publications in time with time to spare and be well prepared for that last week's before that last week turns into a frantic push. But then there was another problem. Turned out that grant compliant reports can happen a year or more after publication, and researchers would often have trouble putting their hands on their accepted versions so long after publication. And now I know there's universities in the US and elsewhere that 
require that their researchers provide open access versions to their institutional repositories, but Weizmann is not a place like that. Weizmann, at Weizmann, it's not the customer's always right, it's that the researcher is always right, and we, we're not allowed to require anyone to do anything. We, we're just there to help. So what to do? And that's quick, there we go. And so we, we had needed a new solution, and what we've been experimenting with is that we started developing this process which combines tools from Esploro, Alma, and Analytics, uh, whereby Esploro provides the grant information added to new assets. Analytics provides a report which checks the updated assets as for OA compliance. And then in Analytics, we were also able to generate a user-friendly narrative view customized to the researcher in order to try and give ourselves a, a more friendly face. And then Alma lets us schedule the report with a cover letter customized to compliance monitoring, which is automatically sent when an updated asset meets the criteria. So I, I, I should say yet again, we have an unfortunate addiction to customization and personalized services at Weizmann, and this may all sound a little crazy to you guys. Um, but that may be why my definition of a good system is one which offers a huge toolbox supporting unlimited creative solutions, because uh, we tend to need them. So, and one of the things that I like best about this solution is that it drew not only from multiple resources, uh, with, with multiple tools among our systems, sorry, my lights just went off, <laughs> um, but it also, drew from multiple resources in the library, and that means people. Um, for, so, for example, the, the process started when our research grants librarian suggested creating the report, the purporting system, and assist, then a systems librarian took that idea and used expertise in analytics to put together the report and the narrative. And then another systems librarian said, oh, hey, we can do an, a letter, we can do a cover letter with this Alma Letters system that will make it even friendlier. And it's just, I, I like it when a, you know, a lot of different resources come together. And so now we can send an informative targeted email that has a chance of grabbing the researcher's attention in a user-friendly format, because attention is a precious, precious commodity. So just to review those steps in a little more detail to give you an idea of what it looks like, um, step one requires that a grant be entered in Esploro and that a link to the grant be added to all relevant assets and that open access details appear in the asset too. And so at the top, uh, you can see the, how we, we actually also record the acknowledgement in full text, but um, it, it also has a link to a specific grant. And then on the, in the bottom, you can see the difference between what a, a, an asset record would look like with open access and then on the uh, right, without open access, the one with the red border. So that's, that's our basic, basis of information that we need. And then step two uses analytics to check automatically if those recently updated assets contain the required open access version. And the logic is a little complex. There's a lot of small print on the screen, but you know it doesn't have to make sense. It's just an example that you can create such a report using analytics focused in on one researcher and their grant. And in step three, we, we expanded our use of the analytics report to create what's called a narrative and or Oracle analytics ser server, which is the analytics system used by Esploro and Alma. Um, now, I don't know if any of you guys have access to Oracle analytics, but if you do, you should really get to know narrative views because they're kind of cool. And they let us turn the tables that come with, you know, you know, usually in analytics, you get a table or a chart, but this lets us turn analytics into documents, or in this case, a letter. And we can integrate text with results, provide context, explanatory text, or even extended descriptions. We can intersperse the text with fields from individual table columns in the analytics results. And HTML, HTML formatting is also available. So using this narrative, what's a narrative is the term. It's it's you know a table is a table, and a narrative is what you see here. It's the term that they use in Oracle. Um, we were able to st strategically place links to, for example, WizWorks, our system, the article page in WizWorks, which 
they could, the researcher can click through to the publisher landing page and to the researcher's own profile page that if so, by some amazing chance they were willing to try and self-deposit, they could. <laughs> um, and I'd love to delve deeper into explaining how narratives work, but there isn't really time in today's meeting to explain the whole thing. Um, but again, they are an interesting alternative to the standard table or chart based analytics output. Um, they can also provide surprising solutions, which you might not expect from analytics. And I highly recommend them to anyone with access to such a system. I don't know how broadly this, this concept is available in other analytic systems, though. At the bottom, there's a link to a more detailed presentation about narrative building that I gave last year. And there it actually does go into exactly how one can uh, build a narrative. So you can see the process there and no self-promotion here. Um, so in that, and in that example, we use the uh, narrative to create a formatted order document generated by our Alma analytics system. And while the specific solution might not fit your organization, I, I, I really do think the concept is, again, really cool. I was thrilled when I found it. <laughs> um, and so just back to our process, the last step was sending the report. And the problem here that there is no letter in Alma that lets us send the result of, an anal of you know, our, na our narrative letter to uh, the researcher specifically, but we, we were afraid that if we just sent a generic report email that no one would open the PDF that was attached with the full details in it. But we found that we could use uh, an, an XSL customization tool in Alma to conditionally add the needed text to one of our existing letters. And I have to say that I really, uh, another reason that I love this solution is because that XSL tool in Alma was actually developed in Alma, in sorry, in Olive, almost 20 years ago. And here we are using this far from new tool to help us assemble a brand new product using, you know, cutting edge tools within the existing system. So obviously this presentation is not meant to be a proposal that everybody here run home and try to do exactly what we have done because that makes no sense. And when I started putting this together, I, I kind of thought my goal was to describe our path through a possibly relevant problem and provide food for thought regarding how excellent infrastructure with diverse tools can be used to provide creative solutions and pull multiple pieces into a coherent whole that meets local needs without local software development. Um, say, Because if you have the infrastructure and if you know the tools as new needs arrive, often a solution can be found and then improved. And we're currently in this stage of improving on that because to make it a little, perhaps a little more uh, scalable. Um, but as I read through the OC OCLC report, there were frequent mentions of local solutions, developing a custom harvester, a local data store, et cetera. And working on this presentation reminded me that over a long career in libraries i've become a huge fan of off-the-shelf sh software so if while i'm trying not to promote a single piece of software i i did find myself wanting to say oh my god it's so much easier to work with off-the-shelf software than homegrown solutions um, i've worked in olive alma almost all the ex Libris products pure b press spring share homegrown solutions i've even written my own solutions and at this point i i pick a vendor solution every time and maybe maybe i'm preaching to the converted and and you all all already have excellent versatile well supported tools that mostly serve all your needs as they develop but nevertheless at my organization i i see a deep undertow that's always pulling us towards local development and and that kind of led me to try and list this make this list here on the screen of the value of uh, off-the-shelf software which brought me to another realization that really what I value the most in this list or this area is being part of a community. And be it a community built around a specific product combining both similar goals and similar tools or the same tools. And I, I confess, I really like that kind of a community um, or a community built around similar goals like CNI. Um, a, community, a community is a really a great place for us to expand our horizons and find new ideas and whatever, either way, the power of sharing is 
pretty formidable. And the library world is constantly blows me away with the amount of sharing that's done. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for letting me bar be a part of your community today. I've been, been enjoying the CNI presentations and I look forward to meeting and learning from you, some of you at, uh, in San Diego next week. And it, hopefully if there are any questions, I've left just the right amount of time. So back to you guys. Well, thank you very much. Um, that's a really interesting look at uh, chaining together a number and adapting a number of um, a number of uh, off the shelf tools. And it's great that you pointed at that OCLC report, um, which I think is is a very helpful survey of the current state of play, especially as it exists in the US. Um, uh, and um, for people who haven't seen that, um, it's well worth taking a look at. Um, questions uh, for, uh, for Joan. Everyone's ready for a break. Well, I suspect they're working up to it. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'll just toss out a, a, a quick one while, while folks are thinking for a minute. Um, so, um, it, you know, you, you make a very interesting argument about um, uh, the, when you're using vendor tools, you end up with a community that can share solutions, add-ons, extensions, things of that nature in a way that, um, you know, a world where everybody's got their own homegrown um, uh, solution doesn't really facilitate. And um, I, I think I think that's a very that potentially that's a, that's an important argument. And I wonder how much you're you're seeing that kind of sharing, particularly as the a uh, number of vendors has thinned out over the years through mergers and acquisitions. Um, I've been part, as I mentioned, I've been part of different communities. You know, I'm still kind of have a foot in the pure community. Um, Spring Share, they also try to do some sharing. I am really a huge fan of Ex Libris <laughs> because over five years ago, they made the decision to make all of their documentation open on the web, and they've got an amazing long-standing community. There's a really powerful user group in the United States. There's a worldwide user group with, you know, each of them has conferences each year. Um, and the listservs, you know, the listservs are just amazing. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I just, the, the you just you're reading an email from a listserv and it's like oh great that's something I've been trying to figure out how to do um, so I, I that's why I I by the time I was done writing my presentation I just had to say that because it's I I can't imagine being in a homegrown solution at this point it would just be very constricting and. I, I don't. I, I think homegrown solutions tend to solve yesterday's problems too, not, and they and and vendor solutions tend to be building constantly and and developing tools that let you so solve new problems as they come in. And and what I was saying, by the way, it's very much. It's like our researcher comes. It's like, you know, I need to have a place to put my open access article, so that I can. Uh, fulfill my need requirement. It's like they just come and they say they give it a, uh, a need and we can say, okay, well, we've got this tool and we've got this tool and we could probably make that happen within a month or two. And it's happened over and over again. So big fan. Okay. Questions or comments for uh, Joan? <laughs> I think you're right, Joan. I think everybody is ready for a break. So Joan, I'm on your website right now and I was just trying to find where where I could uh, link to for my um, AD who is in charge of scholarly publications because I think this would be interesting. Is it is there a link? At the bottom, there's a couple places. We are very small, so our web tools are 
developing always. At the bottom, there is a section of links. You, I see the finger. Work. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's yeah, we have, we, we haven't integrated into the search box yet because our people don't really need to search it. It's more for external people. And again, one of the things that I love about the current solution is that we're indexed on Google Scholar and so on, and we're just seeing growing visits from all over the world. So loving it. Thank you. Other questions uh, for Joan? Okay, hearing none, we're going to go on break a couple minutes early. We will resume as scheduled um, at uh, 2 p 2 15 p.m. Um, Eastern Daylight Time. And um, we will pick up with um, what I think will be uh, a very interesting talk from Ken Klingenstein. So please. Um, Take a stretch and uh, join us again um, in about 15 minutes. Thank you so much. And thank you, Joan, for a very <clears throat> thought-provoking presentation. See you next week. Yep. <laughs> Bye.